welcome to service this morning. I'm delighted that, that we are able to gather again for a time of worship, and prayer, and praise. For those who are watching on YouTube, we welcome you also to be part of our worship service today. Uh, Pastor David Wagner is with his brother in Colorado this weekend, and uh, uh, we have a visiting pastor that I will introduce in just a moment. I am sorry to report that Elaine's husband, Denny, passed away on Monday. Uh, I don't know of what arrangements have been made, but I wish to express the condolences of the congregation to her and the prayers of the church as she looks forward to this time. I would remind you that, that um, uh, we have lots of refreshments in Fellowship Hall following the service, so please come join us for conversation, coffee, and goodies. And then it's my particular pleasure to uh, invite uh, Pastor David Worley to be our supply pastor today. Pastor David was interim pastor for three years with us several number of years ago. And uh, it's um, he and, and Linda is here with him, and greetings to you, Linda. And you have special guest, Pastor, if you would like to introduce them, please. Hi, everybody. It's good to be back with you. We play tennis up there at Camelot Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And that's a miracle in itself that I can still play a little bit. <laughs> but another nice miracle came when a man arrived from Asheville, North Carolina, and enjoyed my, my t-shirt that said, I got this, God. That's the t-shirt. And he recognized that as a sign that I was possibly one with values that cared about the Lord Jesus and the church and the like, and said, I'd like to be your friend. That's how he put it. And I was grateful for the invitation. We have become friends. Not only that, but he is married to an English lady from England somewhere. Her name is Jill, and we welcome Jill, his wife. They make their home now here in, in Sarasota. And uh, he plays tennis quite well, but he even plays clarinet better. So there'll be a little surprise later on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I'm very pleased we can have Pastor David with us. I should point out that, that uh, uh, Pastor David uh, recently, it was the pandemic changes all kinds of celebrations, but he recently uh, celebrated the 50th wedding anniversary and the 50th year of his ordination. So we are very pleased that, to welcome David back to us today as our supply pastor. And with that, I have no other announcements, and uh, we will now begin the. Yes? I just wanted to mention that Barbara Perry is in the hospital. And if you don't know, she's the one that sends us all the birthday cards and everything. So send her a card, say a prayer. Thank you. Thank you for telling us that. Tom. Uh, please silence your cell phones. <laughs> and, with, and with that announcement, we will now begin our worship with the prelude. Uh, Bobby, please. So <laughs>
Truly is a gift to be simple and a gift to be free and a gift to come down just where you ought to be. Thank you, Bobby, for that really nice beginning. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot, cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading this morning is from the seventh chapter of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from this land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple for the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. Word of God, word of life. Be to God. God. The psalm this morning is from Psalm 85. Please read responsively, answering in the bold print. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those that your glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from down. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord, and shall prepare for God a pathway.
second reading is from the first verse of Ephesians. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, this is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and, the leader, and for the leaders of Israel. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O <clears throat> I heard once that if a worship service is planned and there's no surprises in it, you missed an opportunity to let the Holy Spirit maybe do something extra. 
So the surprise I have for you this morning is, and I know there's one among you who said, David, if you just preach a little bit shorter, it might be better. <laughs> and I remember that to this day, and I agree with him. I just can't always make it happen. Uh, so I have a mini sermon and a little longer one. I know that a me mechanical engineer out there, I met him this morning, and I'm sure he knows what a plumb line is, right? A leaded weight with a point usually, suspended from something tall, allowing gravity to center that point exactly at a perpendicular angle. And it allows for building a building straight and true. In scripture, there's a number of references that God gives his people all sorts of things to observe and to obey. And when they do, they're building their lives true. They're building their lives in relationship to others the way God would want us. And so a plumb line becomes an important tool and it helps us know what God's will is for us and to hopefully accomplish his, his things on earth even as they are in heaven. Now I wanna read a vision by a lady and it, it speaks to me of our Lutheran heritage that says we need to live in this world not as if it's our only home we have a heavenly father and we need to walk with feet both in the heavenly kingdom and on the earthly plane. And on the earthly plane, Luther was constantly reminding us that we need to be about the things that bring justice and reconciliation and peace to all people in the name of the father. In other words, the hands and the feet and the voice, even as our Lutheran church requires or reminds us that that's our task. This vision by this dear lady written in 1987, Marie, Miriam, Miriam Teresa Winter, and it can be sung to the tune of Oh for a Thousand Tongues, goes like this. And I want you to think about how straight and true the world would be if we could allow that plumb line of God's word and his love for us revealing Christ to be operative not only for each of us individually, but for the whole of the church and indeed all of society. Oh, for a world where everyone respects each other's ways, where love is lived and all is done with justice and with praise. Oh, for a world where goods are shared and misery relieved where truth is spoken, children spared, equality achieved. We welcome one world family and struggle with each choice that opens us to unity and gives our vision voice. The poor are rich, the weak are strong, the foolish ones are wise, tell all who mourn outcasts belong, who perishes will rise. Oh, for a world preparing for God's glorious reign of peace, where time and tears will be no more, and all but love will cease. I can't get that vision out of my mind, because it would be such a better world if we could allow that to be the plumb line of all that we do. That wasn't bad, that's only about two minutes, right? <laughs> now sit back. Got a few more thoughts on the second lesson. Inheritances. Maybe you've lived long enough now that you receive one or two and they can make a big difference. They can allow you to succeed in some of the wishes and dreams for your life. And they can come in handy to answer problems as well. The best man in my wedding, our, our, my, our wedding, 
was a person who served the Methodist Church for 51 years too, just like I did with the Lutheran Church. And uh, about five years ago, or was it six that I was here yet, and we were busy with the crop walk, I think. I know I'm getting my churches confused. That was with Christ in Englewood. Anyway, he came to visit one time and he had just received an inheritance of his great grandpa's farm in Illinois. And there were no other kids to receive it. And he was the one blessed to observe and to uh, manage it through the years. And, and then when it was time to sell it, he got the proceeds. So he's the only millionaire that I personally know. It was pretty wonderful that at 65 or something, he became uh, a millionaire and allowed him to do a lot of good things. For example, he wrote a check for $300 without even thinking it for my crop walk. And uh, I know he did that for a lot of other things in his life as well. And now he lives in the same kind of community that our, my sister lives in, in Ashburn, Virginia, called the Erickson community. And just to get in there, it's $300,000. And then it's another $4,000 a month. So inheritances do a lot of good things. And I'm not sure you're aware, but the New York Times says that there's $47.1 billion of unclaimed inheritances out there in the world. People that rightfully deserve and should receive it, but they don't know about it and they aren't living as if that's even a part of their experience. And so there's a group called Air Hunters International who employ teams of people to go and seek and find the rightful owners of these inheritances. It's hard to imagine that there could be that much wealth waiting around to be claimed by its rightful heirs. But what a difference it would make in their lives if they knew they had such riches waiting for them. That's exactly the message from the Apostle Paul in our second lesson today. God has abundant gifts he's waiting to give to his children. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are greatly blessed. And he writes, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Note those words, every spiritual blessing. God's love, his love is generous. So by his very nature, God is abundantly generous. He doesn't hold back anything that would bless his children. The power, the authority, the hope, the joy, the peace, the love of God are all available to all of us as God's children. And the question is, why do we struggle so much sometimes in our own personal lives and as communities and in our society with divisions that separate, keep us at war with one another, at odds with one another, and keep some people suppressed and down? Here's a story about an old miser. He buried his gold in a hole in the ground. Once a week, the miser would dig up the gold and stare at it. He savored it. He dreamed of what he might do with it. And then he put the gold back into the hole and covered it up again. One day, a thief who watched that process without the miser knowing, stole his gold. And when the miser came to look at his treasure, all he saw was an empty hole. He began to howl with grief and his neighbors came to see what, what the matter was. And one of the neighbors asked, did you ever use any of the gold? No, he said, I only dug it up once a week to look at it. Well then, said the neighbor, for all the good it did you, you may as well come every week and gaze at the hole. <laughs> Seems like a silly story until we realize that living in ignorance of our spiritual blessings 
is as useful as burying a bag of gold in the ground and never using it. We need to recognize, see, realize, appreciate, give thanks for the many blessings God gives us every day, and especially those that he offers to us by God's grace in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. For that's the foundation, the right perpendicular for everybody's life. And the sooner we realize it, the better our lives can be, both personally and as a society, as a world community. Now, three things I want to say, and I'll try to say them quickly. First, we've been chosen. And we've been chosen by God. When you were in elementary school, maybe like me, I couldn't wait for the bigger kids to pick me to play on the basketball team or pick up baseball that we were doing or some other event that we were doing. And when I was chosen, it felt good. I was accepted and I was valued and I was appreciated. And, uh, and when I was left last standing, like Tim, the tool man, uh, it wasn't so good. It made you feel, geez, you're just left over. Anybody had that experience? We all have, I think. The good news of the gospel is that God in Christ has chosen you from the foundations of the world. And he blesses you with every spiritual blessing. And they're available to us each and every day. And we can receive them through the gift of the Holy Spirit, working in, with, and through our lives when we remember, see, and appreciate all that God has done. So what does it mean to be chosen in Christ? If it means, if you're chosen, it means you're valued, you're appreciated, there's a purpose, there's a vision for your life on this earth. You don't choose a painting unless you plan to display it and enjoy it. And my wife and I, when we first moved to Camelot, thought we should dedicate something good of our artwork, and not that we don't have some nice things, but we got a Thomas Kincaid picture at the Goodwill store. It cost $300, but it was worth a lot more than that. And he's famous, you know, and his paintings and his shadows and his work with colors are, are awesome. The room has got not the best light in the evening, but yet it stands out in the wall and it just makes you proud. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing, a work of art, and I value it. My daughter thinks that my wife and I lead a kind of a boring life. So she said, Dad, you know how much you love animals and you don't have your two dogs, golden retrievers, anymore. Uh, there's a lady that's got 15 kittens. Well, the rest is history. We got a kitten now, nine weeks old, and it flew back with us uh, from Pennsylvania last weekend. In the seven or so days that he's lived with, our, uh, with us, he's gladdened our lives. He sat in our laps. He licked our faces. He does somersaults. He plays with a little ball. He makes us giggle. He's a simple joy. Her name is Lily Olive, after Linda's great grandma. But we chose that kitten among 15 others we could have had because it was so cute and attentive, and I guess I don't know why, but it, what a blessing it's been in that short time. It is a gift to be simple, body, And it was a simple little thing with hair on it that sits in Linda's lap and makes her feel that motherly love that maybe she doesn't have enough of right now. God cares for each of us, wanting to have purpose and value and reasons for doing everything we do each and every day. And so we're chosen.
In God's great realm, there are no grandchildren, no stepchildren. There are no illegitimate children because each of us is a child of God in Christ. We are set free. We are chosen. And let that truth be that which defines you. There is great joy and a feeling of being chosen. A great preacher in the 18th century from England, Jill, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was one of the most popular and influential preachers in England. And he had a paraphrase on this very text. He said, when you are approaching heaven, you will read on the outside gates, whosoever will may come. But when you turn around, once in the gates, it says, chosen in him from the foundation of the world. Whosoever will may come, but also chosen in him from the foundation of the world. We are blessed because we are chosen. And the sign of our baptism is the remembrance of that outward sign of that inward reality that declares you are a child of God. You are loved, you are valued, and so is every other person. Secondly, we realize that we are without sin because God will forgive them, those sins of ours. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. The wrongs that we have done are a primary source of our feelings of failure and unworthiness. But in Christ, we are forgiven and given another chance. Understanding the freedom and joy that comes from hearing that our debts, our sins, our separations from one another and ourselves and from God have been paid in full. All our failures and imperfections and battles deep down in our soul that would keep us from being the best we could be. They've been wiped away. And you are, Paul says, a new creation in Christ. And the Apostle Paul, you remember, serves as an amazing example of the joy and freedom found in forgiveness. Paul wrote, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle the very man who wrote more than half the New Testament, because I persecuted the church of God and his followers. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Even though Paul once persecuted the church, through the grace of God, he was forgiven and given another chance. And with his new life, Paul set forth proclaiming the message of salvations, of salvation to Jews and Gentiles, and all God's people. I want you to know I'm trying to be quicker. <laughs> Sometimes the hardest person that we have to forgive is ourselves. We can maybe find it within our makeup to reach out to someone who offended us or hurt us and forgive them. But some of those things that we've done perhaps are not done or wish we might have done along life's way are things that still can sometimes creep up, up on us and drag us down. Paul wants us to recognize that those things are released, forgiven, and can be a new opportunity for life, a new creation to be born because of Christ and his love. And finally, we are blessed that we realize that we are not trapped by what has happened in the past. There's an old story about a man who ran up to a friend one day and he said, say, you look down in the mouth, you look depressed. What are you thinking about? My future? 
was his quick answer. Well, what makes your future look so hopeless? Just as quickly he replied, my past. If this Bible passage is true, then it is God who defines us, not we ourselves, not our friends and our family. Neither are we defined by our successes or failures or our strength and our weaknesses. God alone defines our life. When God looks at you and me, he doesn't look at our past. He looks at our possibilities. He looks at our potential. He looks at who we could be once we find our life trusting in Christ every day. I've tried to say in my mini sermon on the plumb line and in the sermon from the Apostle Paul in First, Corinthians, in First Ephesians, that God desires the best for us, just like Miriam's vision for the world. It's possible. It's real. If God didn't give it to us and to that lady and to others who've dreamed about it, for example, this great country that we've just celebrated the 4th of July and yet has so many things that somehow would pull it apart rather than allow it to come to fruition and some of the dreams of our, our fathers that went before us and mothers. But it's possible because the good God that we know in Christ Jesus makes that dream a possibility. And if we accept it, live in its grace and its assurance day by day, we can allow that to make all the difference in the world. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it, but we can receive it and we can live in light of it. And by God's grace and through his spirit, I pray for me, for you, and for all the world to reclaim that spirit that in Christ, all things can be made new. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all our understanding, be and abide with us now and always. Amen.
Let us confess using the words of the Apostles' Creed what it is that we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will not be judged the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of God. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy Parent, you welcome your people into one family and gather all things to yourself. Bestow your grace upon your beloved church. Lavish your wisdom upon us. Redeem us from our faults. Let by our witness all might praise your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Awesome Creator, you steadfastly tend to the smallest of seeds and the mightiest of sycamore trees. Spring up green growth from the earth. Nourish the growth of fruit, grain, and other crops. And bless the work of farmers and laborers. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of the oppressed, turn the ears of those who are in power to the voices of prophets in our own day. Protect those who speak difficult truths when it is risk risky to do so. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of strength, you are near to those who endure difficulty. Comfort all who are survivors of violence. Guard the refugee and the immigrant and protect all those who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. We also lift up in prayer those who suffer from illness and disease and from the gradual falling of that building in the surf side. We pray especially for Beverly Arnold, Judy Berger, Mercer and Bobby Brown, Carla Groce, Angie Gary, Ann Glover, Kenneth Gungold, Irene Haven, Scotty Larson, Robert Lawrence and his family, Corey Lee after the passing of Denny, for June McCarthy and Christine McCarthy, for Barbara Perry, who is recovering now at Sarasota Hospital from her surgery. Please remember Mike Richardson and Christine Viscasil and all others that we named this time. Lord, in your mercy. God of love, we pray for this holy house and for all those who do worship here, we pray especially for those whose efforts behind the scenes often go unnoticed. For our office staff, Kate Foster, and our music leader, Bobby Hoberkitsup, and for all of our volunteers, Lord, in your mercy, we thank you, God, for the saints, martyrs, and prophets who died in the faith especially Benedict of Nursia and Bartolome de la Casas, missionary to the West Indies. We remember those in this community who have recently died, especially Ron and Inez Strelo. Unite with them as God's children. Assure us that we are yours forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn your hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy. <clears throat> that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through, your, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Please take your cup and find the bread of life. These are beautiful little things, aren't they? Yes. The body of Christ given for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh. 
We give you thanks for sustaining us with the body and blood of your Son. By your Holy Spirit, enliven us to be his body in the world, that more and more we will give you praise and serve your earth and its many peoples, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, trying to give the Holy Spirit lots of opportunity for surprises. Henry. Henry has the most unorthodox serve you could ever see. <laughs> but it's pretty accurate. sanctified heart and brought it to a time of a deeper faith and a more perfect 
trust. Uh, someone else wrote, all of us have seen some sudden storms in our lives. I think we could probably count this whole COVID year and a half long thing. We've probably all been in different circumstances and situations or other things in our own lives. No doubt. A few of them, though temporary, like these on the Sea of Galilee, can be violent and frightening and potentially destructive. As individuals, as families, as communities, as nations, even as a church, we have had sudden squalls arise which have made us ask one way or another, Master, carest thou not that we perish? <clears throat> in one way or another, we always hear in the stillness after the storm, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? The third verse acknowledges the peace that follows the biblical storm or the metaphorical storms in our own lives with the opening lines, Master, the terror is over. The elements to sweep the rest. Following each verse is the fundamental message of the hymn chorus. Uh, I'm going to read the chorus to you. Uh, I have it on me. Here we go. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Peace be still. Whether the wrath of the storm tossed sea, or demons, or men, or whatever it be, no waters can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace, peace, be still. So we're going to play it through three times. <laughs>
look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.